I'm Caroline Hyde at Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York. And I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, a deep dive into the world of EVs. We break down Rivian's earnings and we push ahead to Tesla's Investor Day. Plus, we'll speak to the CFO of Zoom as the pandemic darling rallies on a strong earnings forecast. And Bain Ventures, it's raising nearly $2 billion in two new venture funds tar targeting startups of all sizes. We sit down exclusively with Matt Harris, Bain Ventures partner, for more. But before we go into the private side of the market, let's dwell on the public side of the market because lackluster day to end the month, of course, and it was a lackluster month therein. Nasdaq off by a tenth of a percent and was underwater by about a percentage point over the course of February. The S&P was down more than 2%. The MSC Oil Country World Index also lowered down three tenths of a percent. In Inflation running hot in Europe. What does that mean about their curtailing and what that means for central bank policy over there that's pushing back on some of that risk tolerance at the moment? The two year yield pushes on higher. So, once again, the theme of the month is that borrowing costs are rising. What does that mean for your risk reward? It ain't pretty. Flick it on. I want to look at what Marco Kolonovic and a lot of analysts on the street at the moment are looking at. But JP Morgan really signaling that they don't think the risk reward of equities versus bonds is really there. The yield at the moment, if you're looking at the yield, the earnings yield you get for holding S&P stocks vis-a-vis -vis where the 10-year yield is at. Premium not looking too juicy, Ed. Yeah, and that's why that forward-looking commentary is so important, Carrie. There was a lot of volatility in this session. You look at Zoom, for example, all told closing up 1.2%, but it had been much higher after a strong fourth quarter beat, strong outlook. Tesla, again, volatile. It had been higher, actually closing down almost a percentage point as we wait for Master Plan Part 3. We'll get into that, but that's coming in 24 hours' time. One big mover to the upside, applied materials up 3.7%. New chip-making machines that will take on ASML, a rival, but lower the cost of advanced semiconductor production. Uh, of course, earnings season continues in earnest. Rivian, kind of the big mover in after hours. They're forecasting, Caro, production of 50,000 units for 2023. That's double last year, but the street reacting negatively. We're down more than 7%. There were hopes that it would be much nearer or even above 60,000. But this is a company that's tightening its belt, chasing Tesla, but trying to narrow its losses. A really interesting one. And particularly on the supply chain side of things as well. They look like overall, Ed, oh, nice run there. <laughs> Um, we saw him pace over, but Ed, as you take to your seat, the mystery of television unveiled. I'm interested to get your take on what's happening in terms of the supply chain headwinds, how that's been hitting production, because as you say, the production numbers just not living up to expectations, even though there is significant growth there. Yeah, look, I had to run, so I had to get back to my Bloomberg and get the latest headlines from this earnings report. You've been the writing is, most of them, Ed. <laughs> the point is, is that with Rivian, right, the expectations were so high going back to November 2021. Sixth biggest listing in US history. They have Amazon behind them, huge names on the street like T. Rowe Price. But they hit reality. Shorts partage, uh, shorts. Uh, parts shortages. They had issues with ramping production because of, frankly, teething problems. Mm. And actually, if you read the shareholder deck, those will continue into 2023. Although I thought reading the shareholder deck, reading that investor letter, they're really trying to sound optimistic, aren't they? The Herculean task they've already had, the way they've ramped, the way in which they've made deliveries via their Amazon tie-up. Overall, is this trying to sort of cover up and mask some of the issues. I thought the focus on profitability was really quite something. Well, look, there's two ways of looking at it. They're burning through cash. So last year's adjusted loss was $5.2 billion, less than the guided $5.45 billion, but a lot of cash. This year, the guidance is for an adjusted loss, excluding some items of $4.3 billion. That's a lot of money to spend. You know, if you can try and compare and contrast with Tesla, which is a much later stage of its life cycle, they spent nowhere near that trying to ramp their production. So Rivian has a sort of an enviable cash balance, but it, my, my word is it kind of burning through it. That said, there's still $12 billion left for them to play with. How much is growth worth? Investors want to see them be more disciplined. And unfortunately, this is the case of the environment that we're in and how we suddenly change. We don't want growth at all costs. How has the CEO changed his tune? You know him well. Yeah, I think, you know, they did belt tightening. So two rounds of layoffs last year, both of them around 6% of staff. So the, to the tune of, of, of 800 job cuts, you know, somewhere between 1,400 and 1,600 in total. That was really painful for him to do, right? He's a founder CEO. Um, the narrative in the shareholder deck is about cost discipline this year. But they have a really exciting sort of horizon with all the new products to come as well. Looking at that horizon right now on those pictures, Ed. We've also got 
Well, the key competitor out tomorrow with some analysis and some insights. Yeah, so that's the compare and contrast, right? Rivian in the early stages of its life. Tesla, master plan part three to come. We'll bring you full coverage of Tesla's Investor Day, which is tomorrow. Steve Wesley of the Wesley Group. And remember, Carrie, Steve Wesley was on the board. He joined just after master plan part one was announced. Well, now we're at part three. We'll hope to get his insight of what that journey was like. Let's talk so much more about the world of earnings. We've done Rivian. Let's push ahead to what was really on the move today in trading, and it was Zoom. You must have seen it, of course, after the bell yesterday released its fourth quarter earnings, and they beat. Shares rallied, therefore, as they reported better than expected results, in particular, a stronger outlook for adjusted earnings. Let's bring in the CFO, Kelly Steckelberg, for more. Kelly, always great to have you on the show. Just tell us about the focus on profitability, this new environment. How were you able to boost them so swiftly? Yeah, thanks for having me. So we are always focusing on opportunities to drive top line growth, but we want to be very thoughtful about our investments. And in Q4, we took a very concerted effort of looking at our expenses in that period and being very thoughtful about prioritizing how we were spending those dollars. And then, unfortunately, we announced a few weeks ago that we were doing a reduction and that that would comprise about 15% of our workforce, which um, some of that has already been impacted here in the United States. And then the rest of it will happen over time. And what that does is it sets us up very nicely for profitability for FY24, which is what we gave guidance on yesterday. And we guided to profitability for the full year of FY24 of around 36%, which was about 20% ahead of where consensus was. And we will certainly keep our eye on, you know, making that profitability, but also looking for opportunities to reinvest if there are areas to innovate yeah. or opportunities to add capacity in our sales organizations. Oh, so tell us where that innovation, where that investment comes from, because I'm looking at Piper Sandler, the analyst there, who say, look, you need to look beyond meetings and invest faster. You're already doing it in AI. Where else are you looking? So we're really excited about the continued growth of our platform. We certainly have already moved beyond meetings. We have Zoom Phone, which is our cloud PBX solution. And we announced on the call yesterday, we sold over five and a half million seats of that product. So really excited there. We also have Zoom Contact Center, which is also our natively built cloud-based contact center. We announced our largest call, our largest customer to date on that platform yesterday. And then we have Zoom IQ for sales. And I should mention that both Zoom Contact Center and Zoom IQ for Sales are highly leveraging AI in their solutions to bring intelligent answers to our customers and our prospects. Kelly, JP Morgan, similarly, you know, they're talking about the new products, when those gain traction, balancing against execution risk. But they also want to know about when the macro picture improves and helps your top line. As the CFO, what are you seeing in your end markets? What are you hearing about the health of your customers and the global economy right now? Yeah, certainly the economy has been a headwind for us on a global basis. We are facing currency pressures, just like everyone else is, as well as, you know, customers just being very thoughtful about every dollar that they're investing. And that was resulting in elongated sales cycles and more deal scrutiny. However, you know, Zoom is very well positioned, even in this market, because we are highly price competitive. And what we offer is the opportunity for our customers to consolidate more on this platform that they already know and love. And they the change management is easy if they already deployed the zoom client and so what we see is that we have an opportunity to really bring more value to our customers and potentially upsell them even in an environment where they might be looking for cost savings themselves uh kelly zoom went there just like every other technology company this week artificial intelligence talk us through the strategy behind ai are you acting a bit opportunistically talking about ai this week no, so AI is not new to the Zoom platform. We have had aspects of AI embedded in our solution for a very long time. We have things like transcription. So if you record a Zoom meeting, you can get an automated transcription 
you know, result after that. We also have translation, which is very valuable when you're working with multinationals. And then we do have some new products that were announced in Q4. We have Zoom Virtual Agent, which is part of our contact center solution. It's our conversational AI solution that was accelerated mm. by our acquisition of Solvi, which was done a few quarters ago. We also have Zoom IQ for Sales, which uses AI to analyze meetings and help make them oh. as effective as possible. So we've been leveraging AI. Um, what I think you heard on the call yesterday is Eric is really excited about yeah. continuing to do more and partnering with OpenAI, but it's not new for us. Kelly, anything new in terms of acquisitions planned? So we are always looking for opportunities. You know, in the call yesterday, we highlighted a few areas that you could see potential growth from us in FY24. Um, that includes continued expansion of the platform. So I think you know, expanding into products, extending our products, what we've done to date has been acquisitions that have accelerated our development. We also talked about departmental applications, which I think lend themselves nicely to potential acquisitions. So we're constantly looking for those opportunities. And you know, it's a big part of how we think about our growth strategy and our capital allocation strategy as well. Zoom CFO Kelly Steckelberg, thank you so much for your time. Zoom shares closing up a little more than 1% following that quarter's earnings. Now, coming up, why Apple suppliers are racing to leave China. That story and much more in our talking text next, Caroline. Yeah, and talking of other stocks that have been on the move on the course of the day, let's go back to our homeland, Ed, the UK. Ocado plunging after the online grocery company there said its venture with Marks and Spencers is struggling to make a profit this year. And shoppers, look, they're pulling back amid those high prices. We saw it down 12%. It's now trading at the lowest since October 2022. This is Bloomberg. has just announced a new plant in northern Mexico. It's its fifth factory so far, but it's first south of the U.S. border. This, as the electric vehicle maker, is trying to beef up its capacity, which already stands at 1.9 million cars per year. It's also, as Mexico in particular, is luring in more EV makers. The likes of BMW, GM announcing investments recently. It's already a real hub for the making of combustion engines. It's a success for the president of Mexico, AMLO, although his exact wish for the plant had been to be built in a southern state of Mexico, which is more economically deprived. Although he did manage to wring out some significant environmental commitments from Elon Musk, in particular, the use of reusable water throughout the manufacturing process, because water is scarce in that part of the country, and water is very heavily needed in the manufacturing of vehicles and their painting. Now let's get on for time for talking tech. And we're going to start with Uber, which wrapped up a $1.75 billion leverage loan sale on Tuesday, becoming one of the latest companies to tap into demand for riskier debt. It will use proceeds from the seven-year offering to refinance loans that mature in 2025, so according to a person with knowledge of the matter. Meanwhile, Dish says some of its data has been stolen in a recent ransomware attack, including potentially personal information. The announcement sent shares slumping to their lowest level in more than a decade since, of course, April 2000. In fact, that's while Dish, Sling, Wireless and Data Networks remain operational. The company says in a filing that its internal communications, customer call centers, Internet sites, they have been affected. And Apple supplies rushing to move production out of China far faster than observers anticipated. That's according to one of Apple's most important partners, AirPods maker Goatech. It's one of many manufacturers actually exploring locations beyond its native China. It's trying to avoid fallout from escalating tensions between Washington and Beijing. And Ed, this is where I think it's really interesting because we know the expanding issues between the US, between China. They began with a trade war. But it's really ramped up, according, of course, not only around the world of technology, but also chips. And right. look, it's spurring the rethink of electronics industries that have had decades old supply chain. We went, of course, to our audience, didn't we? We asked them a key question. Yeah, whether or not China 
needs to take a back seat when it comes to the supply chain? Should there be a shift? 82% of respondents saying yes, need to diversify. What's so interesting for me, Caro, is how quickly this has pivoted to the long-term story. Remember, in the short term, this was all about COVID and the disruption in Zhengzhou and de-risking from COVID. Now it's political. And isn't it interesting that we sort of come off that discussion about Tesla trying to put yet another manufacturing unit in Mexico? So many people trying to yeah. onshore that little bit and make sure that it's a little bit closer to home. And we see perhaps in many ways the cost identification with China all used to be about the bottom line. And in an era where we are talking about companies having to think about profitability, they're also having right. to think about the anxiety, the geopolitics that they become consumed with. Yeah, now de-risking and there's opportunity for emerging markets like India and Vietnam to mm -hmm. take some of that supply chain. We'll keep tracking that. Now, coming up, Luminar Technologies. Wow, LiDAR maker, one to watch. Exclusive partnership with Scale AI for its Luminar AI engine. Another piece of AI news. We'll discuss next with CEO Austin Russell. This is Bloomberg. LiDAR technology manufacturer Luminar is partnering exclusively with Scale AI for its Luminar AI engine. The company announced the partnership at its Luminar Day event and Investor Day and says Scale's technology will now be available exclusively to Luminar and no longer accessible to other LiDAR rivals. Joining us now is Luminar founder and CEO Austin Russell. Austin, of course, you also gave us some financial guidance for, for this year. But let's start with that relationship. Why is an AI partnership relevant for a LiDAR maker like Luminar? Oh, I think we have some technological issues, oh, as is sometimes well, the case, Ed, hey? Yeah, I mean, look, we're still dealing in this world where we're, we're going via Zoom and we're, we're talking to people remote. But look, it's interesting, right? Think about the parallels between Luminar, a maker of LiDARs, mm. and Tesla. Tesla uses artificial intelligence to basically train its system to detect the world around it. Tesla's system does not use LiDAR. It uses camera-only based yeah. inputs. Luminar is partnering with all kinds of automakers, Mercedes, Volvo, because they think that actually LiDAR is the best input when it comes to autonomous driving. And it is interesting, ultimately, how many relationships they're forging with other autos. I mean, you saw the share move on the upside because of an interview you had done with the Mercedes CEO as well. Yeah, so I was at Mercedes R&D Center in Sunnyvale last week. One of the announcements was that Luminar is going to be providing uh, the LiDAR hardware, which goes into their drive pilot system, part of their sort of level three autonomous system. Not yet available in the U.S. apart from Nevada, but a great deal for them. And as you said, the shares really jumped. Let's talk about the U.S. for a moment. Let's talk about regulation in the U.S., Ed. While we get, of course, our Luminar conversation back on track, many have been discussing regulation of technology, big tech in the U.S. They've been talking about M&A oversight, hot topic across many, including founders who are considering, you know, where they should grow their startups. Is this country the best for culturing innovation? Now, I spoke with Wemimo Abe, his founder of fintech Isusu, about his focus on scaling that business and if, as an immigrant from the slums of Lagos in Nigeria, whether the U.S. remains the best place to do just that. Take a listen. It's always about this idea of giving people a fighting chance because no one wants an handout. We all just want a chance to show what we're capable of. But in this country, sometimes that's far-fetched <laughs> and that's what gets us up at night. I don't get excited by the 130 million, 145 million dollars we've raised since Isus' inception. I don't get excited by the fact that we, we grew by 300% last year. I get excited and in my all-end score every month, we talk about the facts that, look, someone just picked up the keys to their home because we helped them establish or build their credit scores. Mm. Someone just kept, we just kept the roof over tens of thousands of people's heads and they were not evicted during the pandemic. There was a gentleman called Scott Falk in New York City that was on the brink of eviction. A plumber lost his job because there was nothing to do during, the, during, the, during COVID reached out to us hopeless because he heard us on local news. We called Scott and paid for three months of his rent. Two months later, Scott called us, and my co-founder and I, Samir, were crying because Scott said, 
I don't know what would have happened to me, but you gave me an opportunity and I have a job that's paying me over $120,000. Wow. That's, that's what point. America's all about. America gives you that chance, but I'm starting to talk to more and more people about the worry that certain regulations, certain ways in which M&A is being pushed back on, certain, let's even say in the world of crypto, yes, it needs to have rules of the road, but it's happening in enforcement is the new regulation. Is there a worry that people are not going to see the US as that? I think there's strength in numbers and there's strength in our diversity. This country just attracts the story this country tells to the world of this idea of creating a more perfect union. This idea that if you work hard, play by the rules, that you can get at it. But that's not true for a lot of people. Mm. It's not true for the African-American communities that have built this country. But still, today, the average white family has 10 times as much wealth than the average black family. It's not true for the Latinos. They have 12 times less wealth than the average white family. So when we think about what's going on, what I encourage us to do, and that's what we did at ASUSU from a pedigree standpoint, is we went to policymakers and said, look, what we are doing, the only thing we're going to plead initially is to plead the Hippocratic role, do no harm. Mm -hmm. When we report rental data at ASUSU, we report no negative data. So as you're thinking about innovative ideas, don't wait for the SEC to struck down your innovative idea. Don't wait for Congress you know, to say things aren't working. Don't wait for the FTC to say this m and won't work, mm. right? Be proactive and just say, look, these are some of the ideas we have. These are the theses we have in mind. And this is how it's accretive to this country. At ASUSU, we're very, very clear. If people establish their credit scores, there are 45 million people in this country that don't have a credit score or have a thin file. The average debt in America is over $92,000. If you do that math and unlock that capital, and people can get access to that $92,000, you can unlock close to $4 trillion in capital. That's not only good for the US GDP, mm. right? It's good for you know, the, the, the policymakers whereby their constituents would also have the opportunity to build wealth and probably vote for them again. So we got to go back to what I call the Badakian days, Eugene Badak, policy 101. If you want to make sure things work, you got to get a village to get onboarded with it. It's not the wild, wild west. You don't build it and break things and come back and ask for forgiveness. Mm -hmm. You go to policymakers and say, I'm interested in pleading a Hippocratic role. I'm not going to do no harm to the best of my abilities and control for that. And be just as capitalist and say, we're going to do good, make money, and we all win. I cannot tell you how inspiring that conversation was with the Isuzu Co CEO, Bumemo Abe, who's speaking at a Cornell Bloomberg Technology event last week. So much more to come across the world of technology from New York, from San Francisco. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Caroline Hyde in New York. And I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. Now, Bain Capital Ventures, Caro, raised nearly $2 billion across two new venture funds targeting startups of all sizes across technology and software, including fintech, infrastructure, apps, and commerce tech. And I'm delighted to say joining us now for an exclusive interview is Bain Capital Ventures partner, Matt Harris. It's a lot of money. It's a record for the firm, I think I'm right in saying. Should we be surprised at the timing? of an announcement of two new funds to this scale? Well, I'll say we're gratified by it. Uh, How so? I, <laughs> well, it's a, it's a nice vote of confidence right. uh, from our investors and some new investors who joined us. And, and I think it should be a boost, frankly, for the ecosystem. I think there is not, in my view, a retreat from technology investing. I think technology is moving very quickly. Uh, and I think what we found is that investors are still very interested. Uh, and this may be, in fact, a buying opportunity versus anything else. There's a wide remit, so it's all stages, early through growth, you know, software broadly, but, yeah. but you're, you're really more focused on the, the end markets. Um, what, what's the thesis behind that strategy? Sure. Well, the thesis is broadly B2B, so I'll start there. Okay. I think, you know, that's what we think we're best at. With Bank Capital, we manage $160 billion. We have ownership positions in hundreds of multi-billion dollar companies. And so what we bring to the table often is those first B2B customers, and that can range across commerce financial services, application software, and infrastructure software. 
Um, and then in terms of stage, you know, we, we build our expertise in these domains, and that allows us to range widely in terms of from seed straight through to the later stages of venture. What's so fascinating, of course, is your own background, and in particular, you've got a background in fintech. I'm looking at some of the portfolios, and I'm thinking Go Cardless is definitely one that I used to report on back in the UK. Yep. What was notable in your statement was how people have recently been questioning due diligence being done on some companies and the ability to really help your portfolio companies. Is that a slight dig of what's been occurring largely in the world of crypto? I think of the FTX fallout. I know that you have exposure in previous funds to DCG. How are you thinking about really doing the diligence on companies in this new world, this new environment? I don't think there's anything new about the way we do due diligence now. I think you know Bain Capital has a, a, a long legacy, I would say, of being very careful, very analytical, and we didn't change anything about that. Um, I think this market environment is better for us. We can do more due diligence uh, in the way that we've always been accustomed to because we have more time to make deals, more time to get to know founders. What was disorienting about 2021 was frankly how quickly everyone had to move, and that mm. didn't play to our strengths. You know, we, we are known for taking our time and doing our work. Um, and so this market environment is frankly much more comfortable for us and our style of investing. And where will you be doing the investment in as well? I mean, are you looking at all geographies as well as all sizes of companies? We're, our team is split uh, between New York and San Francisco. Uh, probably 70% of our work in terms of investing is done in the US, and the balance is done in Europe. And that percentage has been increasing. We frankly, you know, I've been doing this 27 years. Uh, and, and a couple of decades ago, European venture capital was not that robust an area. And increasingly, though, in the UK, as you mentioned, with GoCardless and around continental Europe, we're seeing really interesting opportunities with fantastic multi-time founders. So that's an increasing amount of our attention. Matt, I don't know. I'm looking for your reactions to whether you roll your eyes to this question, <laughs> but I'll just say artificial intelligence. I've heard about that. Um, <laughs> uh, what is your view on artificial <laughs> intelligence right now, and, and, and where do you see the opportunities? I mean, it's been a big part of our investing for the last 10 years. That, that's the thing. I think generative artificial intelligence yes, is should be brand more new. Yeah. But I, I think that's relevant because we have deep expertise in that. You know, Semantic Machines was, a, uh, we think, the leading linguistic artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence company that we were the largest investor in, sold to Microsoft. And we've gone on to invest in the modern data stack, you know, to this day, most recently a company called Unstructured, a company called High Touch. So uh, to us, generative AI is, is the latest in a series of advancements in modern data analytics and strikingly useful. And you know, we already see it in use in our verticals, in financial services, very much in commerce and in marketing and sales technology. So we're excited. Caroline touched on it earlier, but you know, the, the firm uh, you know, last April launched a crypto-only fund and I, and I wondered what your assessment is around the hype with generative AI versus what we saw in crypto-related companies in 2021 through 2022. Are they analogous or are these two separate things entirely? Well, you know, human beings are prone to boom and bust cycles and their yeah. excitement. <laughs> uh, and, and we saw that in, in crypto. Uh, in fact, you know, we've seen it three or four times in the last decade in crypto. Things get overheated, things break, uh, and so far they've always come back. Um, and frankly, AI itself, which is a term that's been around for 30 years, has seen its own boom and bust cycles along the way. I have no doubt things will get overheated in AI, and there will be articles in nine months about uh, uh, the letdown and, and yes. the un unfilled promise. Um, but we think the promise is quite durable as it relates to AI, and we also think that way about decentralization. And we're sticking to our guns on both those things for the long term. So looking for new opportunities in both those spaces, Matt? For sure. Now, I mean, we tend to go where the most passionate and talented founders are. Mm -hmm. That's really the leading lights for us in terms of where we devote our energies. Um, and there have been a lot of sort of fly-by-night crypto founders who have left the field, and that's perfectly fine. But the founders that are dedicated to the ideas of decentralization, of leveraging blockchain technology to disrupt industries, they haven't left. Um, and there will be some fly-by-night founders in AI as well, and we'll ignore those uh, to focus on the really committed folks. Um, so yeah, we're very active in both sectors. We were just hearing from one fintech founder who I was lucky enough to speak with last week from Asusu, talking about 
well, the oversight of regulation here in the United States as well. What are you making? What are the really infused, talented founders at the moment that you're speaking to making of the enforcement in crypto, the focus on fintech, the evolution of regulation here in the United States? Well, I think one way to look at it is actually it was quite striking the absence of regulation uh, for a long period of time. And almost always, in my experience, that leads to a backlash. The pendulum swings, and it often swings violently. Um, but these things tend to synthesize over time. We will end up, inevitably, with sensible regulation. Uh, that has been the pattern. And this is the awkward adolescence. Um, and we're going to see a number of fintech companies outside of crypto who also feel overregulated. I've, I've never met a founder who didn't feel overregulated. <laughs> um, but I maintain the faith, again, having seen many of these cycles, that where we end up will be a friendly place for commerce, a friendly place for capitalism, and a place where founders can get over these obstacles and prevail. So we're very confident, actually. Matt, uh, Caroline and I expect to be talking about venture capital more than ever on this program. And, and as an asset class, for want of a better descriptor, I want to get into your LPs. You know, we talked so much about public market volatility last year, about the Fed. But I wonder who's coming to you and saying, I want to be involved in this project that across the $1.9 billion that you've, you've just closed. Well, I will say, as an asset class, uh, there were a lot of kind of tourists Tourists. Who, who came to the asset class in 2020 and 2021 with a great amount of enthusiasm to invest in exciting technology. And what we saw in 22, as the volumes of venture capital dropped dramatically, was it was mo mostly the tourists leaving. Um, and RLPs are not the tourists. RLPs are endowments and foundations who've been with us for a long time and who know us deeply and know us to be committed players. They themselves are committed players. So I think that's what you're going to see in 2023 is uh, a return to folks who are the stalwarts right. of this industry, both on the LP side and the GP side. That, that is just terrific, both forward and backward looking insight. Bain Capital Ventures partner, Matt Harris. Just a great conversation, Caroline. Yeah, it really was. Meanwhile, coming up, we're going to have another great conversation. We're going to do it with a key founder and the company that's now gone public, medical tech company, Massimo. It's reported earnings. It's boosting its revenue guidance for 2023. We're going to dive deeper into this really extraordinary journey for this company at the moment. CEO Joe Piani is with us. This is Bloomberg. dive yet further into earnings now medical tech in particular and a company that's looking from hospital to the consumer that much more Massimo CEO is with us Joe Keanu joining us on an earnings that is a beat and a raise in many ways it looks like we're looking at fourth quarter revenue coming in ahead of two billion we're looking at your look ahead for 2023 2.4 to 2.46 billion well ahead of the streets estimates just talk to us joe about what's the driving force here is it the hospital the the winning of new consumers new clients or is it the consumer that you want to be targeting more with products well the growth currently that is projected is all about our growth in the hospital from the very successful year we had in attaining both new customers and keeping our existing customers uh, but then, of course, with the consumer business, we're projecting slightly lower growth, but that's because it's not including the consumer health part of our business that hopefully, if it starts taking off, uh, we'll end up doing a lot better than we're projecting. Let's talk about the technology that's underlying all of this. We, many will know you, of course, for oxygen measurement in particular, oxygen saturation. I think of what my daughter's just been to the doctor and put it on her finger. I'm interested, though, as to what the consumer is going to know you for. In particular, new products, a, a connected device, a watch that helps you, well, fundamentally assess your health at home. Thank you, Caroline. As you know, we're the leading pulse oximeter company in the world in the hospitals. Over 200 million people are monitored with our technology. And our pulse ox technology has been proven to improve outcomes. No other pulse oximetry has had that pedigree. So what will consumers see? They'll see a serious product. They'll see a product that's truthful with veracity that can make a difference in their lives. Uh, about a third of the population 
has chronic illnesses. They have serious right. problems in these serious products. And that's what we hope to give them so they can take better control of their lives. Joe, how, how much of that revenue guidance for this year is carried over momentum from the pandemic? I was just at CES uh, at the start of the year in Vegas, and everyone is still talking about how focused the consumer in particular is on health data coming out of the pandemic. Yeah, the pandemic is actually is what gave us the urgency. We all thought about consumer health tracking as either blood pressure or ECG. But the pandemic made pulse oximetry the star because people had these silent hypoxemias. And if you weren't detecting it, you could end up, unfortunately, dying from uh, not uh, breathing properly. So at the time, we were the only real thing. We, within a month, created a product that allowed hospitals that were overwhelmed with COVID patients to send those that didn't need immediate ICU care home and with our veracity and reliability, remotely monitor them. That ended up saving mortality by 70% and about $11,000 right. patient. And that's what's driving now hospitals saying, boy, it really worked. We want to now send our patients home sooner and monitor them remotely with the same or similar technology. Uh, I want to just zero in really quick, John, that EPS figure for full year 23. What is it allow that's allowing you to boost that profit against expectations? Well, certainly one of the negatives of the pandemic was the supply chain problems. Costs went up dramatically everywhere, not just in labor, which is more permanent part of our expenditures, but in materials and supply costs and distribution costs. So as we now are coming out of the pandemic, those costs most of them are going to normal, mm. and we should see that improve our margins uh, into the year. Now, I want to dwell on the W1 for a minute and the watch, because when many people think connected devices and watches, they do think Apple. And interestingly, there was previous exclusive reporting coming from Bloomberg about how Apple is continuing to fo focus on consumer health, in particular non-invasive non glucose monitoring in their smartwatch. Now, I know you are currently tackling Apple on IP in particular, litigation there. Where are you particularly concerned about your intellectual property? Well, Apple contacted us in 2013, said you're the platinum in non-invasive monitoring. We'll sign your confidentiality agreement. <clears throat> Come meet with us and we want to integrate your stuff. We did that. Instead, they began hiring our people, taking our IP. And unfortunately, we noticed the launch of patents with our employees' names on it and then their watch with SPO2. So we sued them for trade secret theft, which is, by the way, going to trial this month or April. Uh, secondly, we sued them in the International Trade Commission for patent infringement, which we just won. We're waiting for the commission's ruling. And hopefully, sometime June, July, we should get the exclusion order so that they can no longer sell their watches with our technology in it. Come back, discuss that with us when you can, Joe. We'll go out to Apple to get their comment on all of this. We thank you so much for spending some time with us. Massimo, CEO there, Joe Chiani. And a lot for investors to dwell on with that particular company, Ed. And I know that we're going to have plenty of investors acutely aware of a key investor day tomorrow of pretty important technology company, Tesla, hey? Yeah, Tesla and what we're expecting is master plan part three. It's been six years since part two. That man that we're showing on the screen, Steve Wesley, joined Tesla's board just after Elon Musk announced master plan part one. So I'm excited to get his take because this is about the evolution of a company that's now going to outline its next 10 years for us. And many remain deeply committed and bullish on this particular company, the way in which it can evolve, the way in which it can go into robo-taxis. We're just hearing from Kathy Wood yeah. last week on that commitment, right? Yeah, and she's still super bullish on Tesla winning that race. But it's also about energy, right? Taking a kind of holistic look of how does Tesla get more vehicles on the road that are electric? Energy storage as well, a big component. I'm excited and it's happening during this show, mm -hmm. which for you and I is tricky, but for the audience, fantastic. Anyway, coming up, Luminar Technologies unveiling an exclusive partnership with Scale AI for its Luminar AI engine. We're going to get back to that conversation with CEO Austin Russell. That's next. This is Bloomberg.
So LiDAR Make Our Luminars having its Capital Markets Investor Day out in Florida, a big part of the roadmap for growth, artificial intelligence. Let's bring CEO Austin Russell back into this conversation. Austin, I know Luminar is a LiDAR maker. What are you doing in AI? <laughs> so uh, we've been actually investing in software and AI systems, I think, for, for years at this point, um, ever since you know, the company came out of stealth mode back in 2017. And part of all this is, is developing this holistic solution you know, for automakers and in conjunction with automakers as, as part of um, you know, both uh, full stack products as well as perception products and other capabilities you know, that we have and are, are able to develop in conjunction. So uh, I, part of the holistic uh, Luminar day though is showing that it is a lot more than just the LiDAR, literally all the way from the semiconductor level up through the whole stack through pro the, the LiDAR system, software, you know, OEM uh, consu and consumer and even insurance uh, as opportunities for what we have ahead as uh, what's addressable. It is also an investor day. You've, you've talked about adding a billion dollars this year to your forward bookings. What is the driver of that growth? Who are you selling to right now? Who are you doing deals with? Yep. So uh, it, it's largely auto, major automakers there too. So I think from an autonomous vehicle standpoint, you know, a lot of people think of these, you know, robo taxi type systems with these huge, you know, roof racks or supercomputer in the trunk or something to like get the driver out of the loop. Our whole thing is all about enhancing the driver, not replacing the driver, and being able to have practical applications of these systems over the course of you know the relative near term here for production automakers. And that's who we're landing these major deals with. Like for example, just Mercedes uh, last week, you know, announced that uh, you know they're collaborating with us to be able to expand uh, Luminar powered vehicles across their whole lineup. So they're now going to be um, you know transitioning for a number of those different vehicles or a broad range of different uh, vehicle models as they said. So that's uh, that's what's happening and yeah. uh, we're getting to it. A lot of revenue growth being talked about, of course, at least 100% for 2023. Gross margin, also something you're talking about, keeping that positive into fourth quarter. How have you had to really double down on profitability as investors just don't want growth at any cost anymore? Yeah, you know, it's a, it's a good question. It's probably more the flavor of the month when it comes to, you know, how much you're investing in growth versus, you know, profitability, and that side of it. I think the reality is like, if you wanted to flip a switch and become profitable, you know, what you know okay. this year here you could but i i think the, the the smart thing to do is set ourselves up on a trajectory where we can be profitable holistically for our core business um starting as soon as you know next year you know on a on a run rate basis there too by the end of the year and i, I think yeah. from a holistic perspective though uh we do have an opportunity to probably be the what would easily be the first uh, you know, profitable autonomous vehicle company or equivalent, because like again, we really have product that's out there that's going into cars like the you know the ones that you're showing there into consumers' hands, and these are like you know, and for many of them, mainstream production vehicles. So we also said that we're now being embedded uh, across over 20 different vehicle models uh, from a number of different automakers globally. Awesome. What's the biggest risk you face this year? How what is going to stop you in your tracks, if anything? Um, you know, supply chain, the, for example. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I mean, I mean, this is the execution focus for this. I think the key is, is being able to make sure that we can get this. Uh, we get our high volume uh, production facility up in Mexico running. Uh, we're successfully executing to that. Uh, we actually um, it j just said that it's, it's actually the Mexico facility is ahead of guidance uh, for what we had. So we should expect that to come online in Q2. Um, versus, you know, what we previously said in the second half. So that's that's going to be a huge driver of scale and what enables us to, to work with automakers. With. And then, you know, starting with these global production vehicle launches. I mm -hmm. mean, that's sort of that pivotal point, we're starting with, uh, with Volvo, for example, later this year. Luminar CEO, Austin Russell, coming to us from Florida. Orlando, no less. We thank you so much for your time today. Meanwhile, well, that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. We will bring you, of course, everything you need to know from the Tesla Investor Day tomorrow. Steve Wesley is going to be with us, as we've heard. Continuing, he's going to be, of course, from the board initially to us with some really great conversation around the announcements coming from that company. Yeah, I'm excited for that conversation, Caroline, because he's worked with Elon Musk. He's heard from him about how you plan for the long term. What will he make of this uh, latest master plan part three? We'll have to wait and see, but tune in for that. And so much to recap from this show, of course. Don't forget to check out the podcast wherever you get your podcasts on Apple, Spotify or iHeart. So much to discuss in the world of global technology.
from San Francisco, from New York, this is Bloomberg. Thank you.